It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker who will formally open this year's Defence Space Conference, the Right Honourable Jeremy Quinn MP, Minister of State for Defence Procurement from the UK Ministry of Defence. Minister, over to you and thank you very much. Thanks, Harv. Uh, it's, as I walked over this morning, uh, I was reflecting that uh, I'd lived a speech not far from here uh, in February. But that already seems like a lifetime ago. A lot has happened. In the intervening time, uh, scientists, as you all know in this room, have discovered a massive comet with a nucleus 50 times the normal size, speeding towards the Earth at approximately 22,000 miles per hour, and fortunately due to misses by about a billion miles. More space tourists have also followed William Shatner's lead and gone where few have gone before. I'm sure many people have said that before. Meanwhile, far more serious events have been happening for us. Within defence, we've had a lot more to contend with and directly impacting on space. Putin's illegal and brutal invasion of Ukraine has provided a powerful and salutary reminder of the operational challenges and opportunities that exist within the space domain. As in every other domain, we have much to learn. In the, uh, I'm going to leave this before it loses me. In the planning scenarios, one might have imagined the lights going out and the communications going down. But that's not to date what we've seen. The determination and resilience of the Ukrainian people has been assisted by the resilience and the utility of space assets. Nine and a half weeks and 72% of Ukraine's communications are still online. We imagined it would take maybe hours on a good day, or more likely, days or weeks to attribute intelligence. That, of course, is not what we've seen. Instead, open source imagery is providing us all with intelligence live. The Kremlin's disinformation narrative, actually, let's not dress it up here, uh, their lies have been made to appear clunky, outdated, and absurd. They said they wouldn't invade. Our ISR said they would. Their claims of what they pretend is the ground truth in Bucha is shown to be a lie when the whole world can see the ground in Bucha. Every individual involved in armed conflicts knows that they're now being watched, and the international community will not forget what they have seen. Another example, absent war, it could have taken years to form the agreements that could help support and protect a country's communications in the event of some catastrophic attack. Instead, responding immediately to this brutal, illegal invasion, we've witnessed Starlink, courtesy of Elon Musk, gifting equipment as well as humanitarian aid. Even when the jammers started their all-too-predictable attacks, Starlink's experts have managed, to date, to stop them in their tracks. In space, as in every domain, it's far too early to draw final conclusions. But the UK, seeing what we're seeing on the ground and in the skies, remains absolutely focused on our ongoing actions to increase capability in this area. Our launch of the Defence Space Strategy in February, coupled with our first integrated national space strategy and the establishment of our single joint space command, paves the way for the UK to become a more resilient, more robust and more significant space player on the global stage. I spoke back in February about our investments, 5 billion over 10 years already allocated to our future Skynet satellite communications, a further 1.5 billion allocated to support defence operations over the next decade, and millions invested already. On next generation, consolid uh, on next generation constellations of ISR in low Earth orbit, on optical laser communication technology to deliver the equivalent of high-speed broadband and on other infrastructure that will provide the digital backbone on which our whole space enterprise depends. Amongst those investments was a pair of tiny shoebox-sized satellites forming the Prometheus 2 mission and destined to have an outsized impact. Built by InSpace missions in Alton, Hampshire, this will be a test platform for monitoring radio signals, including GPS, and conducting sophisticated imaging working with our international partners with joint mission operations undertaken between InSpace, DSTL, and Airbus. But there's much more on board that satellite, for it also carries that sense of adventure. 
that delight in discovery. This mission is about examination, experimentation, exploration. There is so much we need to learn, and we know that Prometheus 2 will provide sparks to illuminate our future in space. And today I'm delighted to update you on Prometheus's progress. Some 40 years ago, the first British satellite, Ariel 1, was sent into orbit on board a US rocket. Rekindling that arrangement in partnership with the American National Reconnaissance Office. This year, we will send Prometheus 2 into space with Virgin Orbit, launching from their new spaceport in Cornwall. It will be the first time the UK has launched a British satellite into space. It represents another giant step forward in our search to become a space power. These latest launches remind us the space is no longer the monolithic preserve of governments. Today, the space enterprise is about collaboration, bringing together the unique skills and intellectual heft of our supply base. Those within the private sector, within academia, and within the international community, those within this room. And the purpose of this conference is to harness that collective brain power, to answer some of the key questions that have arisen from the conflict in Ukraine, and to ultimately apply those lessons to shape our space future. To help kickstart the debate, I thought it might be helpful if I pose a few questions of my own. How can we get more out of S&T targeted to defense need, spend? Uh, how do we get more out of S&T R&D targeted for defense needs? If we agree on buy before, build, or own only where needed, how can we access and protect assured space-based capabilities to deliver military support on operations? And how can we accelerate our collaborations? so that we're not only dealing swiftly with dangers in real time, but minimize the bureaucracy that all too often bogs down space innovation. Perhaps most critically of all, how can we create and enforce international rules so that space remains safe and secure for all? Thanks to research produced by the European Space Agency, we know that humans' behavior in space is improving, that we're getting better at spotting and tracking smaller fragments of space debris. But we also know that not enough satellites are removed from heavily congested low Earth orbits at the end of their lives. I'm sure you're all familiar with that artist's impression of our fragile blue Earth, surrounded by a halo of space junk. Equally, we know our adversaries are far less cautious about operating in space than we are. Only a few weeks ago, the International Space Station was having to take evasive action to avoid Russian satellite debris. The US recently took the bold and I believe the correct decision to ban destructive ASAT testing. But the question for us is how can that be enforced and how do we respond if those bans are ignored? So plenty of food for thought today. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing your deliberations and conclusions over the coming days. Ukraine has confirmed a fundamental shift in the dial. Space capabilities are vital for us today, but will be even more critical for our tomorrow. To reach the outer limits, we must make a space pivot, and we must do so together. Thank you. Hi, so I think we're open for Q&A now, and I think we've got about 15 minutes. Um, and the team here have got questions coming in from online. But obviously, I don't want to forget about those that are in the audience here. So if there's anyone with a burning question right off the mark in the audience, if you want to just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Otherwise, the team will read out from those questions that are coming in from online. And if you're in the audience and you submitted an online question, then please be brave and let's do that human interaction thing where we actually speak to each other. <laughs> And it would appear we're not going to do that. <laughs> I never thought the space community would be so shy. <laughs> oh, we've got a question here. Brilliant. So can we get a microphone here? Hi there. Uh, Tim Robinson from Aerospace Magazine. Uh, question for the minister. Um, will the UK follow the US in a self-imposed ban on ASAT testing, uh, direct missile anti-satellite uh, anti testing? 
even though we don't really have uh, an anti sap capability unless it runs really well hidden with, at RAF Luton. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, th th there is a, there's a long-established rule of government that ministers don't um, uh, create policy on the hoof uh, in response, even to the most esteemed publications uh, in the room. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be doing that today. Uh, but you heard my remarks. Uh, you heard that uh, we are very supportive of what uh, the United States has done. Totally understand uh, the decision they've made. And I think I said that I believe that was the right decision. That was in the words of my speech. So without uh, committing uh, all my successes to government policy, uh, you know that we are extremely sympathetic and supportive of what the United States has done. Here we go. Uh, Julie Holt Jones. Um, working better together has been a shared objective for many years, and there are numerous past initiatives which have achieved much lauded success. Um, smart procurement led to smart acquisition and smart partnering, the co-location of contracting teams, agreed profit margins, open book accounting, etc., have all contributed to shrinking costs, telescoping, defence procurement, timescales and huge efficiencies. Um, my question is, have the hard-won lessons learned in the past been retained or are we relearning old ones? Look, I... I this is not just a question in terms of the space domain, but right the way across defence. Uh, we published um, uh, DSIS uh, last year, which is the Defence Security and Industrial Strategy. And a core part of that is the Ministry of Defence working more collaboratively and productively uh, with uh, industry right the way across the domains. Part of that is telling all of you, academia, uh, industry, uh, our friends and allies, uh, our direction of travel, what we intend to achieve. And we've done that through a series of uh, subsector announces, including the defence space strategy, which followed on from the uh, government space strategy, and as you know, was, was announced earlier this year. So partly, uh, we wish to flag with you exactly what our ambitions are, uh, so that you can direct uh, research and development expenditure, and you can be focusing on the challenges that we are focused upon. Uh, that will produce a constructive and helpful working relationship. In terms of acquisition costs, uh, there is a recognition uh, that we need to move faster and be more agile in all areas of our uh, procurement and be prepared to take risks. Uh, the fact is that space is a domain but that is not unique in this, where I know that not every pound we spend will be well spent in that we won't get a product out of it. But frankly, that learning, that experience, is still money well spent. Uh, so we do need to be uh, faster, more agile, and more cooperative uh, with our partners. I think we're set on the right uh, lines, and I think we will achieve that. Harvard, if you want to add into that. Yes, sir, thanks. I think, I mean, many of you will have heard me talk about this before, and perhaps um, Goddard may uh, highlight a, a bit of this later as we take Space Command forward, and this idea of we did, we did and do have a blank sheet of paper, so we don't want to start way back and relearn all those lessons, as you suggest. Um, so we are looking at better ways to put in place uh, more agile acquisition methodologies. This, this idea of rapid capability office, we all you know, talk about the RCO. Um, I keep saying it's not necessarily an RCO we need. We need a, we need a CO that can do R. Um, and that needs to be the baseline. And I know Goddard is all over that, and I'm sure he'll, he'll mention it later, if not in his pitch, perhaps in his Q&A. I, I would just highlight the, the great example of this is what I mentioned in my intro, which is how we got so quickly to contract for Minerva 1A. And many of you may not know the backstory to that, but it actually started as a Dragon's Den pitch uh, to the Defense Innovation Unit, where we pitched a good idea for this idea of a game changer. Um, and we ended up winning that uh, and then getting the money and turning it into a proper program that didn't necessarily follow all of the historical waterfall charts and the P3M methodology. We got through the Investment Approvals Council, got the money, and we're off and running on that contract pretty much from flash to bang in six months. And that satellite will launch this time next year, thereabouts. So, I think we're off to a good start. Certainly everyone in the enterprise is mindful that we don't want to go back and relearn all those old acquisition lessons. We're also very mindful that the commercial world is moving at such a pace, our processes just don't keep pace with it. 
Um, so again, the establishment of the commercial integration cell at Space Command, sitting alongside all of the capability development team, will help us uh, ride on the coattails of where the commercial side of the house is going. But it's such a live question and topic at the moment, which we're all talking about. We don't necessarily have the perfect answer for it yet. We're just working our way through it. Uh, here we go, Nick. Not a hard question, Nick, thanks. Hi, Harv. Um, Minister, uh, last year we saw the announcement of the AUKUS Defence and Strategic Partnership with Australia and the US. Do you see that partnership extending into space? I see it extending. I think it's a matter for all the partners as to where we, how we take those uh, uh, discussions forward. Um, there is an existing uh, framework which you'll be familiar with, uh, which links all the Five Eyes uh, partners and France and Germany. Uh, and we've got an awful lot to uh, contribute to each other. Uh, so look, we've got, there's a lot happening in, in AUKUS and our capability two pillar. There are a lot of elements that are being uh, cohered and worked together between ourselves, Australia and the United States. Um, so I wouldn't say no, but I would also flag uh, that we do have existing arrangements between the whole of the Five Eyes and as I say, Germany and France, and that does work, that does work well. Uh, shall we take one from online? Uh, who's got the iPad, Dave? So, uh, one from an anonymous user online. And That's always we'll, dangerous. And I think we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get why when I ask the question. Um, how important is the UK's supply base for integrated allied resilience to combat adversary threats today? Um, well, it's, it is critical. I mean, I think this is something which we're all talking about a lot more than we ever did, um, and we need to. So uh, I, this is, again, one of those questions which is actually space is part of it, but it's, it's far, far broader than space. Uh, Post-COVID, I think we all had a wake-up call about where uh, the, the, the depth of resilience, not only we, but many of our allies have, and I think that's been reinforced uh, by Ukraine. Uh, so we have been uh, very focused on supply chains uh, and of uh, resupply. Uh, I, and I think we do need to be very, very mindful of our resilience. That does not mean, it really cannot mean, uh, that every country seeks to do everything itself. Uh, that way lies uh, a vast multiplication of cost. Uh, it would be completely unaffordable and it wouldn't be required. But I think we are all far more focused on the whole of our supply chain uh, and how resilient it is, and how we can work with our allies to ensure uh, that that is uh, stable uh, for, the, uh, for the future, and, and above all, that we've got full and clear picture of those supply chains. We're, we're working on that in the UK government. Uh, the US is doing the same, uh, as are most of our, uh, our allies and friends. Um, I think I would um, just to reinforce the Minister's previous comment about the Combined Space Operations Initiative, the CSPO, Five Eyes plus France and Germany, and actually this is a, a very live topic in terms of uh, using that alliance to both uh, broaden and deepen our resilience right across all of our uh, space capabilities. That's not just the supply sector, but on policy and legislation and us working together in terms of pre uh, presenting a, a united front, a global united front to uh, potential adversaries. Um, there is a, a very a live discussion at the moment around the topic of how space plays into integrated deterrence and this idea of entanglement. And certainly the US team are leading on that discussion and it's, a, it's something that we're right in the middle of. But it plays to the broader supply base but it's, uh, it's much broader than just that. Anyone else in the audience? We've got one over here, just sneaked in at the back. Hi, Aki Bohidla, MOD. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So most of the conversation is talking about the, what I call the closest crocodile to the canoe, which is the geopolitical situation and international security, which I appreciate. But have you guys had the opportunity to think uh, longer term? Like, what are we doing next? Because uh, phase one, I can see it as UK security, if I, I could be biased and think about 
uh, our own national security. I'm sure our partners have their own national security to worry about. But what's phase two, phase three? How are we developing this whole space capability agenda? Well, Harv will definitely come in on this, uh, but just something to pick up. Um, and I'm delighted you work for the MOD, as do I. Mm -hmm. And you're quite right to say that we focus on our national uh, security. Uh, otherwise, taxpayers would wonder what we were doing uh, with all their money. Um, but we all know the best way of achieving our national security is to work closely in alliance with our partners. There's some great news today, as you heard, of how closely you're working with our uh, American friends, and it goes broader than that. Uh, but in particular, our working with the, uh, uh, with the US, we've got so much to contribute to each other. So British programs, but, but working so closely with uh, allies with a huge amount of experience. And that really does enhance our national security, and we hope uh, that we are enhancing the national security of others. So in the same way, in other domains, uh, we, uh, we are international by design. The same must be true of us in space. We set out, and it was a big step when the government set out its overall national uh, space policy and the clear ambitions within it last year. Uh, it was a big step for defence to have a specific uh, defence space strategy uh, and to allocate funding uh, against that, as you know, 5 billion on Skynet, but then another 1.5 billion over the next uh, 10 years. Um, so we are making that commitment, uh, but as you know, it is iterative. We will learn from uh, Prometheus 2. We'll learn from the work that we're doing. And I think it would be a rash person who right now would know exactly where we're going to be in eight, nine, 10 years' time. Uh, but I know that the future is extremely bright. And I know that Harv has got all the answers. <laughs> Thanks, Minister. Um, so it's a, it's a great question because you're right, particularly at this conference, and this, is, this was the little challenge that I threw today, it was uh, we're going to go to this conference and everyone's going to ask questions about Ukraine. So why don't we just uh, tackle that head on and, and have that as a theme running through the conference, particularly in, in terms of this idea of uh, bringing to life the operationalization of space, if that is indeed a word. Um, what I would say, though, is that, as the Minister is absolutely correct, when we did all of the analysis to underpin the defence space strategy and then the broader cross-government analysis on the national space strategy, which we worked up with our team in base and, and right across government, um, it wasn't through the lens of just Ukraine. It was through the lens of where we saw the world in 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so that strategy actually is much broader what has been quite heartening to see is all of the analysis that we did through the broader uh, your overarching integrated review, right down to our strategies, actually the vast majority of what we predicted and said in there, we're seeing play out here right at this moment in Ukraine. And one of the areas that we talked about a lot, uh, two areas really, one was the need to have a solid partnerships and alliances. Well, we're seeing that play out, particularly with space in Ukraine. The other was the role of commercial space. Um, and if you've read the strategy, which I'm sure you have, uh, you'll see that we talked about this idea of what we need to own, where we need to collaborate, and what we need to access. And I've talked a lot about this idea of access and that today's commercial space market has exponentially leapt forward in terms of both pace of delivery and fidelity of capability. And again, we're seeing that day to day. We'll hear, we'll hear about this in some of the panels later. Um, companies like Maxar, who are you know, just uh, constantly surveilling Ukraine and then making those images publicly available, which is helping to de debunk any fake news, et cetera. Um, the big takeaway from that, though, is, is the alliance work and the partnerships and uh, working much more closely together. And I know I just saw General Dickinson welcome, sir. Uh, the commander of US Space Command has talked about this a lot publicly. And we've been very grateful to Space Command uh, uh, in the US, working very closely with our Space Command in the UK to really break down the doors of what that partnership could and should be and you know, opening new doors that uh, have hitherto been closed. And I'm sure uh, the general will touch on this later. But it's a good question. But uh, Ukraine came after we did all of the work. It's just helping to ratify everything that we said, which is great. Uh, I think we've got time for just one more, Dave. We'll probably go back to uh, 
to online, if that's okay. Yeah, that's perfect. And this is from, from Catherine Courtney, so thank you, Catherine. The Defence Space Strategy identified space safety and sustainability as strategic priorities. Does the Minister have a view on the role that the UK should play in driving towards a global space traffic management system? I'm going to ask Harv to pick up that one, but before I do, um, I just, want, I just want to come straight back to the first question that was asked of us, uh, because I've forgotten that General Dickinson was in the room, but I wouldn't want to have to be any ambivalence. Uh, I said, in answer to the first question regarding uh, ASAT testing, uh, that we don't uh, create policy on the hoof. It's fair to say we don't normally have policy about areas where we don't have capability, as the questioner um, asked. Uh, but I wouldn't want to be any, uh, any equivocation or ambivalence that we are 100% supportive of what the US are doing on ASAT. Absolutely, uh, absolutely the right thing, and has our full of 100% support, but I think you'll forgive me for not having a, a ready-baked policy on something where we haven't had the capability. Uh, so, um, Harv, I don't know if you want to pick up the, uh, the, the traffic question. Sir, thanks. Um, so I think the simple answer is we're absolutely alive to that discussion, as is everyone else in the space discussion. And I've had this debate with many, many people in this room, both in the UK uh, and right, right across the world, to be honest. Uh, we all know that space is becoming a much busier place. We know that it's becoming much more congested, particularly in terms of debris, but also as we see all of those applications for small satellites going into LEO, um, this idea of the LEO gold rush, uh, that part of, uh, of the orbital plane getting uh, more and more congested, uh, which in itself will cause uh, more challenges in terms of potential conjunctions. So, you know, we. There's a lot of work happens in this already, using space domain awareness to just keep space as a safe environment. Um, but that will become much more challenging as we go forward. And more importantly, as we realize all of the different international ambitions and everyone puts everything they want or needs up into space. I think for UK, the starting point has been the work that our FCDO is leading on in terms of uh, space norms of behavior, setting that baseline uh, getting new resolution and regulation through the UN so that it's globally recognized. And then we have a baseline of what is good behavior in space. And once we've got that, then that's a solid foundation from which to step off and have more meaningful discussions around, OK, what would space traffic management look like on the global scale, akin to what we have for the air domain? What would an ICAO for space look like? Uh, we're just not quite there yet because we've got to get this baseline in of what is an accepted and recognized norm of behavior for space. But we're right in the middle of it. And actually, in many areas, particularly the work into the UN, it's the UK FCDO that's leading that, um, which is a great opportunity for UK to earn its seat at the top table of, of space, regardless of how many satellites we own or have on orbit. Leading that debate on the soft power side is incredibly important. Um, I think, sir, that's probably enough for us. Um, thank you very much for making the time to come. I really appreciate it, Minister. I Pleasure know how me. incredibly busy you are. Um, and thank you all for getting the conference off to a great start. Great questions. Uh, please don't run out of steam. We've got two days still to go. Um, but thanks. And if you would, wouldn't mind joining me in a round of applause for the Minister, that would be great. Thank you very much. For